So if you'll go over to Deuteronomy chapter 9, that's where we are tonight, and I hope that, uh, the, that the fan noise is not too bad for the, those who are on are watching us by live stream. That's, uh, we may be able to edit it out when I do the uh, editing later on, but, or at least minimize it, but it's needful tonight. It's so warm. I was out working on our deck, uh, as I've been doing for the last several weeks. Yesterday, in the afternoon, in the sun, I lost three pounds working out there oh in one day, sweating it all off. It was very hot, and I could only work for a couple hours. I was beat. Anyhow, so that's not an either here nor there. You don't care about that. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 9. So you, at the top of your sheet, you have the things I've been giving you each week lately, where we have uh, the theological outline of Deuteronomy. That's a good, um, uh, I like the way this is organized, and I think it, it just is a good thing to keep track of where we're going. And it's a good thing to refer back to. The, there's four basic messages that, uh, that are recorded in Deuteronomy. And the first one is a consider, a review of God's faithfulness. And then covenant is what the second one is called, an exposition of the law. So chapter 5 through 26. And that ties in with the other chart that we have on there where one uh, scholar, uh, what's his name? I think I put it in the notes. John Walton, is, um, he, uh, he has uh, proposed that what Moses is doing is working through ideas that reflect or expand on the Ten Commandments. And so far, so good. I, I'm finding we're still in the section that is uh, dominated by the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And I think this is, this is the concern that is being uh, related as God gives guidance to the people about how they are to live in the land as they begin to occupy it. So that's what it's all about there, and I just keep putting that in there so that I don't forget it, and I, just to remind you as well, I think as we re approach Deuteronomy, it's a good idea to have sort of a framework, because you can get sort of lost as you're in each individual chapter and forget about the overall objectives uh, of what God is doing and teaching in this material. So we're in Deuteronomy 9. Our title today is Hear, O Israel, Part 1. The reason I'm calling it part one is because this basically bleeds on over, this, this section goes on over into uh, uh, chapter 10. So we're just going to talk about chapter 9 tonight. And, uh, and I'm taking the title, as you can see, from the very first words of the chapter, Hear, O Israel. So there's an announcement that is being made, and I, it's really significant what God is saying here. Uh, then there's a couple of things we mentioned in chapter 8, the themes of forgetting, excuse me, of remembering and forgetting, or rather, do not forget. Remember occurs in cha uh, chapter 9 as well, verse 7 and verse 27, and also do not forget in verse 7. So maybe we should just take a quick look at those verses and read them. So Deuteronomy 9, 7, remember, do not forget. How you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you left the land of Egypt until you arrived at this place, and you have been rebellious against the Lord. So he's putting, he, he's hitting that theme, remember, do not forget. And then down to verse 27, uh, here he's calling God to remember. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look at the stubbornness of this people or at their wickedness or their sin. So very interesting uh, uh, verses, and they tie in with the theme of the chapter, what God, what God is announcing through Moses. Now, one of the things I'm trying to do with these Bible studies is sort of give you a little bit of, uh, I don't know, uh, teaching or guidance in how to do your own Bible study. If you're taking a chapter like this, what should you do? How should you start breaking it down and thinking about what is being said? So one of the things I like to do with a long passage like this is to look at it, first of all, from a paragraph format. So I want to see where the passage breaks down, at least, and by paragraph format, I mean what the translators think the paragraphs are. There's no inspiration on the paragraphs. We don't have uh, 
You know, and uh, we have this little paragraph marker symbol that is often in many of your Bibles, you'll have that, or sometimes a Bible will be laid out in paragraphs. And uh, that's, that is the judgment call of the translators. It's not, uh, it's, you know, in, in Hebrew, they didn't have that little backwards P. <laughs> it's not a, that's an English thing. So uh, they would just write their verses and, 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 uh, and the Hebrews, when they originally wrote these things down, they did not have vowels. They didn't have any way of indicating vowels. You just have consonant after consonant, and the reader just had to know what they, you know, what these, well, these words worked. And of course, it worked for them. But people who came on later are scratching their heads trying to figure it out. So, uh, but, but I think the translators, if you look at the content, have done a pretty good job of breaking down the passage for us. So we want to look at it paragraph by paragraph. And uh, so what I want to do tonight is to start there at the paragraph divisions. So where do you see the paragraph divisions in the passage, and what is the main theme or subject of each division? As you can see, I've got six of them okay, for this chapter. So if you look at the chapter, maybe you want to identify what's the first one, the first paragraph division. One through three. Okay, now you do, will have to speak up because... Uh, I, we are competing with the fans. So verses 1 through 3, what would you say the general theme of those verses, or the main theme? You can sort of summarize that section into one idea. What's he talking about here? Anybody want to? Remember. Okay, remember God, right? We know forget. <laughs> we know forget. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anything else? Debbie? Remember God will be with you uh, against the giants. Okay, remember that God will be with you against the giants. That's close enough. And uh, the thing I put down is I am leading you across Jordan to confront people you fear. But that's basically the idea. These says, now you're going to this land. You've heard there's giants in there. God is leading you. So that's the big thing in this section. All right. Now, ver what's the next section? Four through six? Okay, okay. so in my Bible I had a paragraph marker at verse 6, so this 4 through 5 was the paragraph. Okay, so what do you think of that, that section? What's, what's, what is he saying here? Yes, Tola. It's not their righteousness, it's not because of their righteousness, but because of evil. That's right. Okay, so it's not their righteousness. They're not going to have victory over these nations because how, of how good they are. That is the big idea in those two verses. All right, so the next section is a bit longer. Uh, how far does it go from verse 6 on? Where does it end up? 14. Okay, verse 14. That's the next section. All right, so what's the main theme here? What's he talking about in this section? He's reminding them how stubborn they are. But what is he? What specific incidents is he mentioning? Pardon? The golden calf. The golden calf. Okay, so you remember, Moses was up in the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and other instructions from God. And in the meantime, they are waiting down there 40 days, and they say, where is Moses? And so Aaron makes the golden calf, if you remember. Okay, so that's the section. So he's bringing that up again. It's like... You know, Moses, you keep harping on this. You keep saying this to us. Yes, listen. Hear, O Israel. Okay. All right. So that's the theme of this second section. When does the, the fifth, or I mean the third section, the fourth section, where does it go? What verses does it cover? Okay, 15 to 21. All right. And so, and what is the theme, the main theme of that section. Well, God's judgment, but what about, what's, what's it, a, what's, um, I, I should look at the verses myself. Okay. Pardon me? It's telling them that because of their sin, God was angry with you. Right. 
Okay, so, so Moses is, is, is laying out God's anger. He's, he's the consequences. It's Moses' actions and consequence. of what Because he says, I came down the mountain. I found you in this place. I, uh, and he talks about how he dealt with the calf and so forth. All the same things. Uh, does it tell, tell me he broke the ta tablets yes, here? Yes. Okay, so all these actions. So God, you know, uh, he's, Moses is expressing God's anger over this section, over what they had done. All right. Then, what's the next section? Number five, yeah. Question. Sure. I, I've been looking here. I've, looked, I've read into three different versions. Oh, you got three different ASD. versions. Oh, well, I got it done. Yeah. But I, I've read into three different versions, and I don't, none of them have a backwards P, so I don't know where oh. to come up with. Well, many Bibles, many, especially many printed Bibles will have that backwards P symbol. And that'll tell you where the paragraph is. Oh, I see. So just because I'm not Yes, you're That's using that technology and it's throwing you off. Oh, Kaylee's has paragraphs in it. Okay, you'll have to get her program. <laughs> I know, and this is a translator's choice. Maureen's noting that sometimes the paragraphs are different. And that's true because, because translate, this isn't inspired, it's just basically a theme, right? And mine doesn't have a backwards P, it's just indented. Right, right. You know, some of them will be indented. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, actually, when I'm reading a Bible, like I have my, uh, I I have a Cambridge Pitminion Bible. It's a little Bible. That's what I m mostly read, and that one is set up in paragraph format, and I really like it be for reading because it it helps me to to think about the whole thought section as a thought. When you're doing your own Bible reading. Uh, if you don't have a Bible like that, it, it might be one that you might want to look into at some time because uh, it just, uh, personal reading, it does help break the thought into sections for you. But regardless, for preaching, I like a verse by verse because I want to say, if you want to look in verse whatever, I want to be able to find that verse quick. I don't want to be looking, okay, it's in the paragraph, where is it? Can't find it. Okay, so that's why I like that for preaching. But it's, it's all kinds of different things. I don't know how many Bibles I have uh, some of them I, I have worn out, and I keep them. I don't throw them away, all right? But I have others I bought for various reasons, and it's just the way it is. All right, so, okay, so the next section, we are, uh, where are we at? Number five now? 22 to 24, that's right. Okay, now, this is a very short section, but what is the big idea in this section? Augustine? Still yeah, they just disobey God. They're always disobeying God. And so we'll come back to this in just a minute. All right. So let's see. And then the last section, of course, is verses 25 to 29. What is the big idea in this section? Moses' intercession. Moses intercession. So Moses is praying for the people. Now he came down the mountain. He was very angry, right? He... He broke the tablets of stone. He made them drink the water with the golden calf ground up in it. I'm not sure how that would be. That would not be very good. It's, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, tang or <laughs> it might be golden, but it sure wouldn't be. <laughs> wouldn't agree with me, I don't think. All right. Okay, so uh, as I noted here, I put in the notes that, we're, that, that, that this, this section continues on over into chapter 10. But we're going we're gonna to just work with the material we have here in chapter 9. All right, so the main emphasis of section 1. Um, you know, what is it? The, okay, so what is he announcing to them in, in section 1? What, this is verses 1 through 3. Okay, God is with you. You're about to go into the land. But it's not just God is with you. God is leading you as a warrior. Okay? Uh, I will go before you. Uh, that's verse 3. The Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. So, you know, they were afraid back 40 years before when they went into the promise, or they were about to come into the promised land. They heard the reports of the giants, and they, could, they couldn't believe they could make it. They thought, we'll all die. And they forgot who God was. God's, and Moses reminds them here, God is going ahead of you. Okay, he's going to give you victory. You can count on God. All right, now, um, 
Now, in the now we've already noted that they, the, the, your victory is not going to come because you are righteous in verses four and five. Okay, but they are going to have victory. What are there's two reasons that are given in verses four and five. What are those two reasons? Okay, because the people of the land were very wicked. And God had deemed that this is the time they will be punished. All right, so that's number one. What's the other reason? He promised. I can't find it. <laughs> yes, he promised. It is there, yes. Because of his promises to the Father. That's right, the promises to the fathers. And that is in verse uh, 5, right at the end. The oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there is, there is God's judgment on the nations, and there is God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the two reasons. And so God is, so those are rooted in God's nature. I mean, God is, of, is holy. He cannot tolerate sin. And in fact, God, the whole world lies in, uh, under God's judgment. Uh, John 3, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But he says, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. I'm paraphrasing. I think that's verse 18, 17 or 18, the following. You see, people are already under the judgment of God. God, in his mercy, allows people to continue on in this life. He does it so that, uh, I think it says in Peter, that they might repent. He got, God wants people to repent. He allows them to live out the course of their lives. When uh, Many people do not repent. Many people will not hear God. They refuse to hear God. But God gives in his mercy... Sometimes we'll give them many days, live a long, long life, and uh, with the opportunity to repent, and yet they, they do not. So, uh, so God is, God is, is a, a judging God, and when uh, he comes to the end, when we come to the end, when it comes time for judgment, then God's judgment will fall on, on people who will not follow him. All right. But there's also the idea of the promise. So these people, he says, I'm not giving you this land because you're righteous. I'm giving it to you because God, I promised it to Abraham. So this is again based in God's character. God, God's word is true. He, uh, he made a promise to Abraham. He's not going to go back on that promise. Now, uh, we've talked about modern day Israel. Modern day Israel is not a perfect place that most of the Jews who are there do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ some of them do but most of them do not and uh, and and God but yet I believe the reason that state exists is because God is faithful to the promised Abraham uh, it could be that he would allow them to be taken out of the land again before the end that's certainly possible but God still means to keep that promise because he made it with Abraham. All right, so I do think that's this is a this is a big thing about God's character and also the dependability of His word. When we, God's word says, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved," we know it's true because God's word is always true. If He makes a promise, He keeps His promise. All right, so uh, we're not moving very fast. Let's see what the next section. Okay, sections three and four rehearse in detail the golden half calf incident. And it's aftermath. All right. So Moses' uh, intercession. Now it's briefly mentioned in section four, but it's repeated in detail in section six. Okay. Why do you think Moses repeats, uh, refers to this twice? Okay. He he was wrathful, and God was angry, and then he talks about how he interceded through that whole thing in uh, the last part of the verse. Why do you think Moses repeats all of this? Keeps going on about it. I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah, for is for emphasis. Emphasis. Emphasis is for emphasis. Yes, for emphasis. All right, repetition is for emphasis. Yes. Okay, is it, I, can't, I can't hear you from the fans. So you will. I'm do, we're doing our best. All right, so. And then what else? Uh, what point is reinforced by these details? That they deserve judgment. Okay, they deserve judgment. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Now the, he's going to come in against the Amorites, or that what do you call them here? 
the giants, the Anakim, okay, he's going to come in against these Anakim because they're very wicked. But is Israel in any better state than they are? They deserve judgment as well. All right? So God is using these people, or he's using Israel in spite of their, uh, despite their, right, their unrighteousness. Okay, so, I mean, that ought to give us a little hope because God can use us too. All right? So, now I have a lengthy section here where I'm going to talk about section 5. Section 5 is the very briefest part of it. It mentions other places with a brief mention of the Kadesh rebellion again. So it repeats that. And it concludes with verse 24. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day I knew you. It's like Moses. You know, uh, remember the story of Moses? He's, he's born to Amram and uh, Jochebed, okay? And, and Jochebed hides him from the Egyptian officials because the law was you have to kill the boy babies. So he's hidden. And you know the story how he's discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. And she says, I'm going to, I'm going to adopt him. And you know the long story. So he's raised in Pharaoh's palace. Now, no doubt he has some contact with his family. He knows his family. But his life is entirely different from theirs. He's raised in the palace. And there's a lot of high politics going on. Uh, I've studied this a lot. And I, uh, I would like for the pharaoh to be ha this pharaoh's daughter to be hatship set. I don't know if it was her or not. But I would like for it to be because it just seems... Uh, to fit with the scenario as Moses grows up and, and as he competes with those with the Pharaoh. Now the Pharaoh who he is fearful of, he has to know him personally. Okay? It's not like this is some you know guy showed up on the throne. This is part of this family. He's been part of that family. He has to know that man personally. And when he uh, delivers the Israelite from the Egyptian who had killed him, uh, you know, he's, uh, or, who had, or excuse me, he had killed the Egyptian who had been persecuting the Israelite, and then he finds out that it's known, he knows he's in trouble with Pharaoh. Okay? But the thing that is interesting is Moses knows this people, his people, for a long time. He knew what they were like before he left Egypt. He spent 40 years in the back of the wilderness taking care of sheep. He comes back to these people. He tries to negotiate with them to get them to listen to God's message. They're kind of reluctant. Finally, he wins through. They go through the plagues. He leads them out of Egypt, and they're complaining every step of the way. He says, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day I knew you. Isn't that something? Okay, and this is 120 years of history he's talking about. All right, he mentions three place names. They're not in chronological order. Order. The first one is Tabera. This has to do with three days after Sinai, the people complained and fire from the Lord broke out among them. And that's recorded, Numbers 10 through 30, verse 35, 35, 36, and then 11, verse 1. Tabera equals burning, so fire from the Lord, Tabera. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that, but that's close enough. And then the next one is Massa. This is on the way to Sinai. After they've crossed the Red Sea, they haven't got to Mount Sinai yet. The people grumbled about the lack of water. So Moses struck the rock under God's orders the first time. So Massa. Massa means testing. They are testing the Lord. Later on is Meribah. It's not mentioned in this list, but Meribah is one that had happened fairly recently and was the reason that Moses wasn't going into the land. And then he mentions Kibroth Hatava. And again, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm just reading it. Okay, so it's, this is in the wilderness not too long after Tabera. They complained about manna, 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 manna all the time. I'm tired of manna. I'm sick of manna. We've had manna long enough, right? Okay, so that was... So God sent them the quail, and he also sent them judgment with the quail. And that's recorded also in Numbers 11, verse 4 through 34. Kidbroth Hatava means graves of desire. They wanted meat. He said, all right, I'll give you what you want. And some of them died. Okay, so this is the judgment that he's mentioning. Okay, so in the, so there's all this rebellion. 
we have these examples. He mentions those three things, plus the Kirjath, uh, Kirjath uh, how do we say it? Jerim, where is it? What verse am I in? Verse 25, is it? Or 24? Oh, okay. Oh, Kadesh Barnea, that's what I mean. Kadesh Barnea, all right. Not I don't know what I'm thinking about. Kadesh Barnea is where they refuse to go on the land. So those four things he mentions, and he's using those as examples. He says, look, you aren't righteous. God isn't leading you into this land because you're righteous. God isn't going to win the victory for you because you're righteous. And then he has this long section of inter intercession, intercessory prayer, verses 25 through 29. What is the main basis of Moses' appeal to God for the people? What is the main thing he bases his prayer on? The promise. The promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant that God made with the people. All right, so I want to, at this point, I want to just go through a few application points and think about this passage. So we think about the, all these things that have been said in the chapter and how they tie into one another. There's some key details that we pick out of each section to help us see how the progress of this is moving along. All right, so application number one. The only kind of people God can use to accomplish any of his purposes on earth are unrighteous people entirely dependent on God's grace. Okay, so here we are. We have an opportunity to serve God. We have an opportunity to be a witness to be a Christian in our world. We can shine light into our world. But the thing that we have to remember is, as we're doing that, we are unrighteous people. We don't have any righteousness of our own. We don't go in to try to reach other people, to bear the gospel and say, you know, uh, you down there, you need what I have. <laughs> it's not that. It's, you know, I'm a sinner like you. I need this and you need this. You need this gospel. And I do think that, that what, what uh, Moses is emphasizing here is remember where you are from. You, God's going to give you a victory, but don't think he's giving it to you because you're so good. He's giving it to you because he promised, because they're wicked, and he's going to take care of you, and he's calling you to serve him, right, with humility. All right, so that is the first application. The second application the distance between God's wrath and his people's salvation is one man. All right, so God was ready to destroy the entire nation of Israel that he just taken out of Egypt. And one man stood in between. And who's that? Moses. All right, now, God would be righteous to destroy every man who was ever born because of the wickedness of every man, right? God would be righteous. But one man stands in between, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, everything we have spiritually depends on him. We have to, uh, we need to be, we need to be conscious always, I think, of the grace of God, which, which really sustains us and keeps us, uh, enables us to serve him. Without that, we would be nothing. So we're, that's, we depend on one man. That's really significant. And this is uh, uh, the, the Israelites who are hearing this message. They need to realize that the only thing that stood between them and absolute destruction was one man who prayed for them. And that's it. And, 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 and called on God to remember his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, that is it. And really, Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. It's the same thing for us that stands between us and God's wrath. All right. All right. So I'll move on. Point number three. Redeemed people need to remember that God has bought them body and soul for his service. Our own ambitions need to submit to God's ambitions for our lives. So here's the children of Israel. God delivered them from Egypt. God led them through those 40 years to have a new generation to take into the promised land. God had, God, they owed everything to God. They owed everything to God for their survival. They owed everything to God for the victories they were going to have in the land. They owed everything to God. God had bought them. Right? Well, God has bought us. Every, anything that we do in this life ought to be 
in in the in the idea of if God wills it, we will do thus and so. I think in the the book of James, at the, I think it's in chapter five, where he says this. You, you say, I'm paraphrasing again. You say, well, tomorrow I'm going to go here and there, and I'm going to buy this, and I'm going to buy that, and I'm going to do this business. He says, you should say, if God wills, I will do this and that. Right? So here's the idea: God owns us. He has. God has paid for us. Now we need to serve him. And so in the back of our minds, it doesn't matter what you do in this life, you need to be someone who has, is committed to serving God, to living for him. There may be things that you would like to do, but they don't fit in with God's will. Maybe it's something you read in the Bible and you realize, you know, I should change the way I think about that person or that thing or that, that event. Maybe there's things in this world where you should say, you know, I need to step away from that. I need to go on a different path. I need to value different things. Might have to turn away from things that we really like and we really love. But, you know, there comes the, the thing of it is, is we are here to live for God. And so that was the message, I think, that he's communicating to the people. He says, look, he says, you're, I'm not bringing you in because you're so good. I'm bringing you in because I made a promise and they're wicked. Right, so we do need to know we're serving God on his terms, not on our terms. Anyway, I have a quote here from Matthew Henry. Now this comes from, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Matthew Henry. He has a six-volume commentary on the whole Bible. It's quite old. It's, it's written in Old English, and, you can, and he's very wordy, okay? <laughs> you can read through a lot of stuff in Matthew Henry, and it's just, oh, you have to really pay attention to what he's saying. Now, uh, the man named Thomas Scott came up with, he took Matthew Henry's six volumes and he distilled it down into one volume. So this is from the concise Matthew Henry. So it's partly Matthew Henry and it's partly Thomas Scott. Right? And so this quote comes from there. But it's on this passage. He says, It is good for us often to remember against ourselves with sorrow and shame our former sins that we may see how much we are indebted to free grace and may humbly own that we never merited anything but wrath and the curse at God's hand. For so strong is our propensity to pride that it will creep in under one pretense or another. We are ready to fancy that our righteousness has got for us the special favor of the Lord, though in reality our wickedness is more plain than our weakness." But when the secret history of every man's life shall be brought forth at the day of judgment, all the world will be, pro will be proved guilty before God. At present, one pleads for us before the mercy seat, who not only fasted, but died upon the cross for our sins, through whom we may approach, through se though self-condemned sinners, and beseech for undeserved mercy and for eternal life as the gift of God in him. Let us refer all the victory all the glory and all the praise to him who alone bringeth salvation. And I think that's a worthy word for us. That's really the theme of this chapter. Remember, he says, where, where you were. Do not forget how wicked you were. And remember that God has saved you on the basis of his covenant, not on the basis of your righteousness. It's a really amazing thought as we consider this chapter. Okay, we'll close with that.